Hello, and thanks for tuning in. I am that nerd dad, Joe Williamson. Oh, we had a good one today. A uh, friend of the show, Shannon Newspangler, pastor and hospital chaplain is here. And um, look, with all the craziness that's been going on in the U.S., um, I I thought having her perspective on it is, um, is timely. She's a, a mother of two boys, and... Um, She's got some thoughts on the shootings as well as Roe v. Wade. So it's a heavy one, but uh, I think we managed to have a good conversation that is digestible and um, enjoyable. So I think you'll like this one. I really do. I think this is going to be my best episode ever. I don't know if that's true. And before we do that, though, uh, first off, thanks for tuning in again. Uh, second, if you're watching or listening to this, there's probably a subscribe or follow button. Give me, hit one of those for me. Uh, there might be a five star or thumbs up option. Always greatly appreciate those. And comments. I like comments. I like comments. Um, comments are good too. So, with all that being said, all the busy stuff. Let's uh, let's get to Shannon. Are you listening? Damn. Uh-huh. All right, everyone, as promised, my guest today is Shannon New Spangler, pastor and hospital chaplain uh, at New Spangler on Twitter, mother of two boys. Uh, and today's topics are a meme, shootings, and Roe versus Wade. Yikes. Okay, uh, let's t- <laughs> thanks for coming back, Shannon. Uh, even course. after I suggested these insane topics, um, I want to start with the meme you shared like a week ago. Uh, okay. Here it is there on the screen. Uh, patient, there are no women chaplains in the Bible. Chaplain, there are no hospitals in the Bible either. And you've got the, uh, so deal with the sunglasses on. Um, is this a real thing? Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, it It is totally a thing. I'll go into rooms. I mean, it's not just a thing for chaplains. It's also a thing for pastors. But I'll go into a room and I'll have somebody say like, you can't be a chaplain because you're a female. And I'm like, uh, okay, but, but I am a chaplain. So I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. There's still, um, in, in certain circles, there's still a lot of sexism about women in leadership. In fact, I get harassed on Twitter all the time, um, from guys and I'm not the only one women pastors get harassed all the time and they'll quote scripture at us out of context and tell us we're not allowed to, speak above men and we're not allowed to be preaching and those kind of things. And I mean, at this point I kind of let it roll off my back, but yeah, it's definitely still a thing. So you're a pastor. You're, you're a very good person. I've known you now about a year almost. I think we've been communicating. Um, you're a good person. You won't tell those people to go fuck themselves. Um, (laughs) but I will. So if you ever need to just tag me in, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I'll jump in on it for you. <laughs> All right. I will. You know, actually, that is that is the thing that has to happen is guys that are supportive are the ones that have to say something because a lot of the times those guys that do that won't even, they either won't engage with you, like they'll stop talking to you or they'll just talk down to you. And then when a guy jumps in, they'll be like, like they, it's a different conversation. So it's very strange. It's, it's like when a spouse brings the husband to the, uh, the car dealership. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just like that. And I mean, I'm thankful for men like you and, uh, you know, that will that will step in. And I I mean, there are times when I've, you know, like I can't do it in my job, obviously, but there are times when I can't be in the hospital. I know that person's dying, but you need to go fuck yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So um, it depends on the day. Most of the time now, I just kind of I'm like, whatever, it's not worth engaging. I know what I'm called to and I know who I am. But sometimes I get angry and kind of snap back. And yeah. do they ask you to leave, or do they ask for like, um, can we have someone with a penis? That'd be preferable. Uh, both, both. I get okay. both. <laughs> um, sometimes they just won't talk to me. Sometimes they do ask me to leave. I've been asked to leave. Um, sometimes they say, "Is there, um, is there a guy?" Like, yeah, oh sure. My and God. like. <laughs> Pardon the expression. Oh my God. I didn't realize. (laughs) No, no. It's, I mean, the thing is, it's like in the hospital, I don't even, it's just like, okay, I don't have to worry about that room. I'll send one of the dudes like no problem. Um, I took it more personally as a pastor because 
I'm, I'm the only pastor. Like if I'm the only pastor and somebody comes into the church and says, I mean, I had this situation once, um, we were dealing with getting a loan for the church and, um, a, one of the bank guys said, can I talk to the pastor? And I said, yes, that's me. Um, and my board, my, the director of my board was with me, who is a guy. Um, and he said, but can I speak to the person in charge? And I said, yes, that's me. And he said, can I speak to somebody more in charge? And I was like, there's nobody more in charge. And the the director of the board finally stepped in and was like, she is our pastor. She's in charge. You have to listen to her. Cause he was just not going to have a conversation with me about getting a loan. And I was like, Oh, the crap. Like, I hadn't, like, I think, I'm not, I'm not oblivious to the fact that sexism within churches probably exists. Um, what you're describing is insane to me. You're supposed to be there to you know, help. And, and they're just like, I don't believe you because you're a woman. Right. No, that, there is a lot of that. There, I mean, yeah. And to, for people, I, I'm glad that it's, for you, it's like, that's insane because it feels insane and it makes, like, it feels, it, I, I think I can speak for other women clergy. It feels like gaslighting. Like they're trying to convince me that I'm not, that I don't have the education I have or that I don't have the call that I have. And somehow we're the crazy ones when they're the ones that are being crazy. I don't know. Yeah. You're like, strange. I'm not holy enough because of because my lack of my of... genitalia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good God. It's so okay. bizarre. I literally like okay, so that that meme prompted prompted me to like reach out and be like, I want to talk about that. I, I want to talk about that. And then um, the last two three weeks have happened in America, and it's gone uh, bonkers. It's gone gone crazy. Um, well, the crap sits a van, right? Yeah, and and look, I the U.S. in the last. I don't want to just paint all of the Trump era, but like it's been bubbling and, tr and the Trump era kind of brought a lot of it to the fore forefront. I agree. Um, it's, I think, I think Trump emboldened a lot of um, racist assholes and now yes. they feel like they have a voice and a microphone and there's no consequences for their actions. Right. As a result of all that, um, we're starting to see, uh, not an uptick in Matt in shootings, but I mean, they're always part of the U S culture. I'm rambling a little bit. I'm just going to get to the point here. You are a mother of two boys, um, school age. How does the news affect you? Do you talk about, uh, the, with your kids, um, as a pastor, how is this affecting your, your, your community? Like just talk about it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much in there. Um, yeah. Let I'm me sorry. Speak first. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. Um, let me speak first um, as a mother, because when this first started happening, um, when Sandy Hook happened, um, I was not a mother and it affected me. I am, I am a deeply emotional person. I'm an, I'm an, um, I'm an empath and things affect me like emotionally. Um, and I will get sort of obsessed with things and then go down rabbit trails and then like be sobbing. And <laughs> my husband will be like, okay, you have to step away from the news. You you have to stop. Um, and that was before I had children. And so when Sandy Hook happened, I was heartbroken and I was angry and I was sad. But this time, and not that it hasn't been happening since then, it obviously it has, but this is the largest one since Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. um, I am kind of freaking out. Um, I, If I allow myself to kind of like look into it, I start hyperventilating and it it just feels it feels insane to me that this is just allowed to happen that nothing changed after sandy hook after 20 some children babies were just murdered in the classroom and nothing changed and what has changed is um <laughs> my son came home my oldest um came home it was like a week before this happened. So like last week sometime and said, today we learned about how to hide in the classroom and how to hide in our cubbies if a shooter comes in and just kind of was nonchalantly talking about it. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, this is our plan. We're putting the onus on our children to protect themselves and hide in cubbies rather than doing anything about anything else. 
we're putting the responsibility on our children. It is insane to me that this is just, how things are going. Just wedged in there between math and uh, and arts and crafts. Right. Uh, we're also going to hide just in case of a shooter. Just a pr heads up, practice time. Heads up, heads up. We're going to hide. And like, and like, part of me was glad that he was sort of like nonchalant about it because like he doesn't get it. Okay, good. But part of me <laughs> yeah. was furious. That you have and, to do it in the first place. Right. Like, <laughs> instead of doing some policy where maybe it shouldn't be legal for an 18-year-old to buy a gun. They can't legally drink. They can't legally rent a car. But somehow they can buy some AR-15s and 300 rounds of ammo. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And that's a simple little change. And... um. I was researching this because, of course, like I said, I get obsessive. Um, the average age of school shooters, you want to guess? 17. 17. That's exactly Is it really? Right. Yes, it's 17. I hate the fact that I was right. Yeah. And so, like, okay, so there should be, we should be doing something about that. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm furious and I'm heartbroken and I'm, having anxiety attacks and like it it's not that it's more important this time it's that why are we still dealing with this why is this still happening and it's not happening in any other country in the world but somehow our old white politician men are saying it's not about guns well yes it freaking is about guns and i might get a little rowdy and cuss here because i'm a cusser and <laughs> I, I apologize for that. I, I know you don't you, care, but yeah. <laughs> but I get so worked up about this stuff. And when people are like, it's not a gun problem, I'm like, yes, it is a gun problem. It's a mental health problem. Because other countries don't have mental health issues, it's a video game problem. Because other video other countries don't have video game problems. Like it's just the the stack of cards that you have to put up in order to say that somehow the United States is different than every other country in the world in all of these aspects and that the difference is not the guns. Like it's, it's insane access. to me that it's, you could somehow get there. It's ease of access. Yes, absolutely. It is ease of access. Ease of access. Ease of access. Uh, they have, uh, I'm in Canada. Uh, we have hunters in Canada. Uh, I think we've had two mass shootings this year. Right. Um, and I don't think any have been in a school. So it's it's ease of access. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and I, 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 I was kind of rambling and, and working this out as I talked about, talked about it the other day. Um, I compared it to getting a child to try vegetables. And I think the politicians in the U.S. just need to try it. Just just try, try a bite. Try, a, try, try the smallest amount of restrictions and regulation and see if it's palatable. Just, just right. take a little taste. Maybe, right. maybe you like the reduced reduction in deaths, and right. you well, maybe I'll have another helping. <laughs> and you, and you go down there. Don't start big. Don't start with we need to ban right. guns. Start small. Start with a bite. Well, and Try I it. think that this, for me, the thing that's happened is there is kind of like twofold. The GOP has, um, and I, I think it will be very clear. Guns over I, people. I heard that. I like that one. GOP <laughs> guns over people. Anyways. Oh my gosh. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> so the GOP has done two things. First of all, they've created fear. And that's what I am convinced that foundationally, that's what they do for everything. And we can talk about that when we talk about Roe versus Wade, because I think it's there too. Yep. They've created this fear that we need to have guns to protect ourselves from all the bad guys who are getting guns. And so they've created this fear. So everybody needs to have a gun. My rights are so important because I have to have this to protect my family. And statistically, the more guns there are, the more killings there are. It's just statistically true. It doesn't matter if good guys have guns. And by the way, good guys with guns is such a farce. Like you're going to know how to act in that situation. And this situation, like these are trained cops, like the situation that happened in Texas, trained cops who literally have their guns on them every day, supposed to be good guys with cops, Oh, good guys with guns. Sorry, I get. Yeah, yeah I get you. I'm with you. Keep I get on. rowdy. They did not go into the school because, and I want to quote this: they were afraid <laughs> that they were going to get shot or killed. Uh, so they, they preserved their own life, of course. Somehow, 
it's okay for citizens to have these kind of guns. But the but cops trained won't professionals, even, yeah. But train, yeah, trained professionals won't even don't even want to go in because they're afraid they're going to get shot and killed. Yes, that's exactly the point. So instead, we're going to sacrifice our children for your love of guns, for your right to own a gun. It's bullshit. It just <gasps> is. You swore. I, I know. I'm oh sorry, God. but it just is. <laughs> and it, it's like, as a parent, even not as a parent, as an aunt, as a person who loves human beings, I can't, I can't fathom that even one child dying this way is not enough to change things. It just, I have all the feelings about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that opportunity to move to Roe v. Wade because you said the idea of one child, yeah. and and uh, look the 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 farce of we need to protect. Uh, fetuses uh, compared to what they're prepared to do or not the, what they're not prepared to do to protect children in schools has been beaten to death. It's obvious. Um, as a pastor, I know you have kind of a unique uh, perspective on this. I and um, I'd, lo I'd love to hear it. Okay. Your thoughts um, on Roe v. Wade. So Roe v. Wade. Um, so uh, it, this is a complicated one, and it's one that I've changed on through the years because I grew up in a very, in a fairly conservative um, household. Um, abortion is wrong, no matter what, et cetera. Um, and as I've sort of grown and as I've sort of <laughs> experienced life and seen things, it's gotten to the point there that I have come to that for this situation, I think um, we have to consider circumstances. And the bottom line is that, and this is something I tweeted, nobody is getting an abortion just for fun. Okay. This is not a, this is not something people just do for the heck of it. It's not birth there's, control. There's always a reason. And whether or not you agree with the reason, not relevant. Mm -hmm. okay, there's always a reason. Um, and I'm going to share one little story, um, which is just an example of the fact that we have no idea what's going on in someone's life. I was talking to a woman in one of my churches, and she's probably in her mid-60s. And she was talking about how she felt like she was a bad person and she was going to hell and those kind of things. And I kind of, as I began to get to know her and d dig in and those kind of things, it got to the point that we figured out, that I figured out what was stemming this. When she was younger, when she was in her early 20s, she was married to an abusive man. And she got pregnant and he would kick her. He'd throw her down the stairs. Um, she'd have bruises and those kind of things. And she decided to get an abortion um, because for the protection of the baby and for just because she didn't want to be tied to this man forever. She was trying to figure out how to get out of the marriage. And 40 years later, she is convinced that she's going to hell because of this choice. Because that's what the church has told her. That's what Republicans have told her. And for me, if you look at that situation, she was trying to protect herself. She was trying to protect the baby. Um, and she made a decision that nobody wants to make but was the right decision. Um, what, had ha what would have happened if she'd brought that baby into the world? That baby would have probably also been abused. That baby might have been, had to stay connected to that man. She would have had to stay connected to that man the rest of her life. And so that's the thing about abortion. It's like, nobody's just going in and being like, oh, I'm gonna have abortion just for fun. Like that's, please. Like nobody's mm -hmm. doing that. And whether it's because you're an 18 year old who isn't ready to be a parent or a 20 something year old who is afraid of bringing a child into the world that's gonna be abused or whatever the circumstance, the choice is made because you think that that choice is going to be the best outcome. And so I am not willing to 
condemn anyone for making that choice. Whether it's because they're not sure that they can love that child, whether it's because they're not sure that they have money to provide for that child. I mean, the amount of children that are in poverty. And so for me, it's, it's that we have to allow people to, we have to trust people to make that decision. That decision is the best for them. Um, and on top of that, the GOP calls themselves the pro-life party because they're pro-fetus. Um, and that started, I don't, do we have time for a short history lesson? Go for it. Okay. So I don't know if you know when that started. That started back in the 70s when Richard Nixon was being, was campaigning to be president. Um, he decided that it was a strategy in order to get on the side of the Catholics that he was going to be anti-abortion. And it started off as a strategy and it worked because he got elected. And so since then, it has grown into this huge wedge issue. And it's sort of like this, like, have you heard like one issue voters? Yeah, yeah, of course. This is a main one issue voter thing. Yeah. They don't care what the policy is on anything else. But yep. if the person is anti-abortion or pro-abortion, it's, yeah. it's, it's a deal breaker. Yeah, it's a deal breaker. breaker. Not yep. that anybody's pro-abortion, it's pro-choice, right? So it's a deal breaker, but they have created this like monster and it, it works. Obviously it works, right? Because our, you know, like even when Trump was campaigning, one of the things he talked about um, in one of his campaigns was how all the Democrats want to have these abortions and including like partial birth, birth abortions. Nobody's having a partial birth, birth abortion, please. But that's that fear piece again, right? The GOP yeah. is like tapping into people's fears in order to manipulate them into doing something. And pro-life, that word is just false. Bullshit. Bullshit? Bull, yes, bullshit? it it's is. Bullshit. Because if you're pro-life, then you would be, um, then you would care about immigration. Then you would care about kids who are being put in cages. Then you would care about kids who are being shot in schools. Then Medicare. you would care about free lunch programs. <laughs> I mean, like, there's just so much that. Yeah, they really, they really stole that phrase, pro-life. Right, they're they not. Just... They're pro-fetus, and nothing else. Because once that baby is born, they don't give a crap. They're not going to take care of it. They're not. You know, you just it. like almost quoted George Carlin directly. I don't know if you realized. Did I really? That. Yeah. I don't. Was, you must have seeped into your subconscious. That was almost a direct have. quote from George Carlin. Um, Shannon, I, 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 I'm going to say this. I love you. You're amazing. Oh, um, thanks, no, Joe. I love no, you too. No, because like you're so well spoken. You're so eloquent. Um, I, uh, I am not religious. I and and the fact that I am so comfortable talking to you about these things is um goes to show the level of good that you do as well as um how well informed your opinions are and um and and open-minded i mean look i i i can't say i talk to many pastors on a regular basis um i think i've talked to uh one in the last decade and it's been you um and <laughs> And and I and truthfully, um, the the work you do in the hospital um, for all of those assholes who don't want you there, uh, and for the ones that do, uh, I, I I thank you so much. And we'll do this again very shortly. Yes, thank you so much. Of course, Shannon, you're the best. Thank you. And recording. That's it. It's the show. I told you it was uh, palatable. I like that word, palatable. Um, we talked about some heavy shit, but. We have to. The world's on fire. Got to talk about it. So I want to thank Shannon Newspangler for her time, her patience, and uh, her thoughtfulness. It's always greatly appreciated. You know who else I want to thank? DeanBlundell.com, home of Canada's number one podcast network. Uh, I'm there too. Ding! And um, I write for them pretty regularly. Three, five times a week. Depends on the week. Depends on how busy I am. Um, what else do I want to talk about to wrap it up? I want to talk about merch. Oh, I got merch. Canada, Canada Day. <laughs> Father's Day is coming. You can get a shirt for Canada Day if you want. Father's Day is coming. 
why not get dad a shirt? Uh, we got zero days without a dad joke. World's okayest dad, which is my bestseller so far. Uh, raised by Homer, Peter, Stan, and Bob. Or just the classic that nerd dad. Available in all kinds of colors. Through the Dean Blundell store, there's a link at thatnerddad.ca if you need it. And I'll close that image and say, uh, talk to the camera for a second and say thank you. We are rapidly approaching episode 100. Uh, I want to say this is episode 96, maybe 97. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, and I, I just, I'm astounded that we got here. And I'm super appreciative of it all. Um, so, thank you. Be well. Be safe. Thanks for listening. Damn.